Good morning, Southside. Special greeting to any visitors with us this morning. We are grateful to have you. We have uh, Ann White back with us. Where'd she go? I saw her walk in. To God be the glory. She's here with her husband. So your name? Someone yelled out. Dan. That was easy. <laughs> yeah, without any hearing, I'm going to give it up. Um, so grateful to have you with us. I wanted to make one announcement because we have 73 babies being born this year. Um, you knew it was coming is we need a lot of help in the nursery. So I want you to pray about serving in there so these moms and dads can come and, and worship and hear the word of God. So there is a code up there. And for those who are technologically advanced like myself, you just put it right up on there. When it comes up, you click it, and there'll be a form that will come up. So we know sometimes you intend to want to serve, and you go home and you forget. So we thought we'd do it right here, because hearts are being stirred. I can feel it. The nursery. So if you feel led, just click that, and um, we'll keep Heidi Killian's sanity for another month. So let's help her out. Well, we've been studying through Philippians. If you'll turn with me to chapter one, we're going to finish up chapter one this morning, uh, Lord willing. And I just feel like we've hit gold. I, I hate finishing chapters when I'm drinking this deeply from it. Uh, let me summarize what we've been seeing. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is about him. And it's powerful and it's a pervasive message as it takes you up and you just cry out, here's my heart, Lord, take what is yours. And Paul's been sharing what, it, what it's done in his heart to the Philippians. And we saw that in verses 3 through 8, we're to put the fellowship at the gospel at the center of our koinonia, of our fellowship, of our relations together. We're partakers of grace, Paul said. I have the affection of Jesus Christ for you because of this gospel. So the question is, is this happening to you? Is it growing as you gather with the people of God? Are you taken up in the gospel? Is that what binds you and unifies you and keeps us as one seeking to lift high the gospel of Christ and to grow in it? Secondly, we said we're to put the priorities of the gospel at the center of your prayer life. I'm praying to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ that I would bring glory to God the Father. And we want to abound more and more in this true, genuine love for one another. Praying for ourselves, bearing fruit. Pray this again and again. Have you done this for anyone in this body since we went over it? Have you done it for yourself? Going to the throne of grace, God, conform me to your image so I can approve what is excellent. I want to live faithful to my God. Are you applying these things as we're journeying? Thirdly, put the priorities of the gospel at the center of your circumstances. Are you growing to look at your circumstances as how do I use them to advance the glory of Jesus Christ and his kingdom? God, how will these circumstances put Christ on display that I'm facing this morning? About fourthly, put the gospel at the center of your world and life view. Whatever comes my way, life or death, I just want to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in my body for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It will be more of Christ. And that is our world and life view. That is the essence of what this gospel has done in our hearts. And now this morning... We're going to see that we're to put the gospel at the center, center of our unity and our suffering. So this gospel message, it, it binds us tight, and we, 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 we suffer together to advance it. And so it, it brings an amazing unity when you get Philippians 1, 1 through 26. So we will take that up this morning. Let's go to our God and ask his blessing. Father, we finish up Paul's thoughts on this section God, I'm asking that you would take these truths and by your spirit, you would enlighten every mind in this room. And Lord, that what would come out are hearts that are burning, hearts that are burning to live worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, hearts that are one and unified that nothing of lesser value than Jesus Christ could break our unity. God, if there's any disunity, 
in the midst of this congregation this morning, I pray by the gospel of Christ, would you melt it? Would you remove it once and for all? Would you help us all to live worthy of this gospel? And disunity is not worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, move powerfully. Let us be one. Let us be striving together for this beautiful name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless every heart here this morning, I pray. Amen. Paul's going to now turn his attention to exhort the Philippian church about this glorious gospel that we've been looking at. He's going to now use an imperative verb in verse 27. And the rest of this section just hangs on this first sentence. And he's going to say, now, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of of the gospel. <laughs> your, your life and the gospel live, live in a manner that they're balanced, that they, they fit, they're in agreement, they, they're, they're right, they're one mind. Live worthy. So let's take a look at 127. I love that word, only. Only, uh, just a, a paraphrase of when he's going to say, one thing I do. This is only as all-encompassing. It would summarize the entirety of the Christian life. If I had to boil down my burden for you, Paul's saying, it is this one phrase. To summarize how I want you to live in light of this great gospel, here it is. So when you hear the word only, your ears should perk up. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Here it is, child of God. It's a high calling for those who have been saved. How few take this to heart anymore. How many hearts are taken up with this question and this concern? How then shall we live? What should such an excellent gospel do to my heart and to my life? What should be my offering under the new covenant to my God? As I considered what Paul is telling us, it hit me. This statement is so simple. In your everyday life, you try to make a statement by the way you conduct yourself. We have the, the, uh, the youth all together for this uh, boot camp. And I was just thinking about when I was a youth, you, you want to make a statement by the way you dress, talk, walk. You're, you're, you're an advertisement. You're social media. It's images everything. And the Christian is to make a statement that is in harmony with this gospel. We're, we're to make a statement. And the first question that should come to your heart then is, how do I live in harmony with this gospel? What is the statement that my life is to make to this world? Let's see Paul's answer. Conduct yourselves. Palatuo, uh, it's, the noun is uh, the, the word city. And it's in the classical Greek, polis. Polis, it was the largest political un, uh, unit of the day. And the Greeks belong to it kind of like we do to a country. So the noun refers to your citizenship and the verb which is being used here is to conduct oneself worthily as a citizen of the city-state. So for the Greek, the, the polis was more than a city, it was their life. They, they had laws and there was a part of its being. Its customs were, were something you were proud of. Uh, they knew all about it and they knew each other, all the inhabitants. The polis demanded your loyalty and you gave it willingly and to you, that was the best thing in life. <clears throat> so Paul is not thinking here of belonging to a literal city, but he says, the church, you belong to the citizens of heaven. We are members of a Christian state. And what he's saying, if I had to summarize this word, is citizen yourselves. Citizen yourselves. So Paul's just not after their daily conduct, but where do you belong? That's the question to you this morning. To whom do you belong? You must have this consciousness about you. You have this dual citizenship. When he opened this letter, he began with it. And it seems to be forgotten in our day and age that earthly citizenship is your true home. And we need to fight for, for that. And, and the, the church is becoming a place where you fight for your earthly home. And, and Paul's saying, you're to be a colony of heaven here on earth. You've been taken out of this evil age by this gospel. You've been brought into the blessing of the ecclesia, the church, and you are a holy people set apart for God. We are this assembling of aliens and sojourners. And now he says, behave as citizens of heaven. 
Don't act like those who are living according to the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life. You, you've been called out of that. Citizen yourselves of heaven. Don't live like this is still your home and still your hope. Live like a child of the king. You're to be so different. You're, you're a citizen of a whole other place. Don't make this your home and your hope. Alistair Begg said a summary would be this. Our conduct is not to jar with the melody line of the gospel, but to jive with it. It cannot be, look at this glorious gospel and have a life that is out of tune with what it proclaims. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. It'd be like if I sang in that choir that you just heard. Um, you'd be like, what is that? Um, here's this harmony and beauty of being a citizen of another kingdom and and I can't be a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. I desire that unbelievers would come into our church and into our homes and they would get a fragrance of the life that is to come. This is a call to the church corporately. The church used to be called a parish, and it meant aliens, just citizens of another world. I wonder sometimes if we've forgotten who and what we are. We're the Southside Parish. I've heard people say that teacher gave me a love for biology. I never had one that did that, but I've heard it. That coach has given me a love for the game. That artist gave me a love of art. And that polis, the colony of heaven, gave me a love for Christ. Uh, I pray that would be common in our midst. I love what the church is designed to be. And my heart is more and more jealous for it to be this billboard of coming attractions of where this is all going to culminate. The assembly of God's called out ones is a heavenly calling to spend the rest of their days on earth to spread the gospel and to live heavenly lives. What binds us together is love of our nation and our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. People are losing sleep because the USA has lost its love of country. But what keeps me awake at night is that the church has lost its love for its homeland. We, we've lost that love. Where to die is gain. So let me ask you, what is this colony that we belong to to be about? What, what is to be the focus then of all that we do together, Paul? Well, he says, it, it, at first, it needs to be worthy. Our lives should fit with the gospel. If you walked in this morning, our lives are to fit this gospel. The gospel is that you're a spiritual stillborn since Adam's sin. You come into this world dead in your sin and trespasses, separated from God with self as the, the reigning principle of your life. You're separated from God, and by nature, Paul said, you're a child of wrath. You're under the wrath of God, and you have no ability to remove it by being good or cleaning up. And in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son into this world. And his son came into this world and he obeyed and he, did the, he lived the life that God requires of all of us. He came and he fulfilled perfect righteousness. He gave what the law required. And then all of our transgressions of the law, he went up on a cross and he bore the punishment that the soul that sins must die. And he did it as a substitute. He was a burnt offering. God poured out his wrath and Jesus drained every last drop that our sins deserved on that cross. He bore the fires that were meant for me for all of eternity. There's only one way to get the wrath of God off of you and it's by Jesus Christ hanging on a cross, bearing it. And you get a full forgiveness of sins. My sin not in part, but all have been nailed to the cross and I bear them no more. It's been given to me by, by faith and not by works. I don't have to go work to try to get that. God, by grace, offers it to the one with an empty hand and will receive it freely with nothing of yourself. Free sovereign grace, grace given it by faith to believe this simple and beautiful message. Faith then joins me to Jesus Christ and he's the fount of every blessing and God now looks at me as if I lived his life and I died his death, and I have Christ now for everything, for life 
and godliness. And now I stand in grace, his favor, in his grace he will finish the work that he began. Hell itself cannot stop the work that God has started, and he will bring you home. He will bring you home forever. If you've never believed that or surrendered to that, I ask you this morning, that's the gospel. And then for the believers, will you live worthy of that gospel? Will you live lives that fit that gospel? Man, do I want to grow in this? I want to live in a way that becomes a God who saves ruined sinners by Jesus Christ. We need patriots for heaven. Paul, can you flush this out? I I need more detail. That just feels broad. Well, let's flush it out then. Paul says in verse 27, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of you. So there's some things that are worthy of this gospel that Paul wants to hear about Southside Bible Church. First, he says, I I pray that you're standing firm in one spirit with respect to the gospel. I, I worthy of the gospel is that you are standing firm in one spirit. What does the church stand for? What is the church about? I wonder if we asked our neighbors, what would they say? What does the church stand for? Most often they know what we're against. <laughs> I'm for that God, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to anyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. I'm for that. I'm for a God who saves guilty, ruined sinners. And we've drifted from this. I have the gospel of the heterosexual. I have the gospel for homosexuals, Democrats, Republicans, poor, rich, black, white. I have a gospel for everything else. There's one gospel for every soul, but we stand firm in it. We have good news. We're telling the world about everything else. Here is the great issue of the church. It's in a carpenter's death. The issue is the cross of Christ. I have one string on my banjo and I want to play it till I die. We're the colony of heaven on earth, the church, and we're to stand firm in one spirit. The faith of the gospel, the essentials of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we hold to him to the death. And I've watched its power again and again. And I say we hold to this gospel and preach it and sow it and transform our lives by this gospel. We're to hold our ground and stand firm when all hell comes against it. I watched this movie, it's called Glory Road, and uh, everything, I just want to remind you, everything I watch is on this thing called Clear Play, so if there's naughty words, don't think your pastor's listening to those things, I just tune them out, okay? So Glory Road, there's this guy named Neville Shedd, and this big guy knocks him down and dunks the ball, and the coach just goes, we do not back down in here, and he kicks him off the team. And I just, we do not back down from the gospel of Jesus Christ. If all hell comes against it, by the grace of God, we stand. And we do not back down and we preach it and we proclaim it. We're to have a tenacity and a perseverance in the midst of all the conflict that's rising and growing. This call is to stand and to be steadfast. I will not be moved away from this gospel. The psalmist in Psalm 44, 18 said, Our heart has not turned back, and our steps have not deviated from thy way. We are to have one spirit about us south side, and we can't retreat, and we can't back off. We hold to this truth, and we cling to it, and we take our stand even if we see many retreating. United we stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't wave a flag. We lift high the cross of Christ. That is to live worthy of the gospel, to be unified and to make much of it. I wonder how many have forgotten what the church is about. Unifying that. Secondly, to live worthy, Paul says, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. With one mind, we're striving. To stand now is a a defensive word, and now he's going to give us an offensive word. So we stand, we don't retreat, but we go forth. Striving is where we get the word. The Greek word is from athletics, <coughs> effort, toil, sweat, wrestling. It's not a bed of ease. We will wrestle to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not 
soft. We, we, we can't pull back from this eroding world. It's not time to sit on your rooftops in your pajamas. We, can't, we, we cannot learn how to live in this world and never offend it. That, that is just, that's our culture and it's the air we breathe and we are gonna stand in it in love and truth and we are gonna move forward and not retreat. It's a whole team. The whole team, it's not a one-man ministry. It is a whole team. It's all of us striving together. And not everyone is on the front lines. We got many gifts in this body, and Paul said they differ according to the Holy Spirit. Some of you are praying behind the lines. Some are organizing. Some are encouraging the wounded soldiers. Refreshments. Watching the children so soldiers can be strengthened in grace. Setting up microphones for the preaching for our marching orders. Some are showing the love of Christ to visitors, BBT, praise God, Sunday school. Some are having fellow soldiers over for a meal and edification. Some are giving coffee so you don't fall asleep during my sermons. We're all striving together as one to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Church cannot be a yacht club. It's a battleship. And this is what will keep us focused. This is what brings unity. This will overcome all our differences where we don't nitpick and argue. This is what unity is all about. It's not getting all the denominations together by the lowest common denominator and say, unity, that, that's baloney. We come together, he says, for the faith of the gospel. This is what's called a genitive of origin. And it means the faith which is based on the gospel. So we're striving for the faith which is based on the gospel. And so one hard question, have the years of being in church, the weaknesses and hurts, taken up your focus, where I just see everything that's wrong with the body of Christ, that is my focus and that's my fellowship, quite frankly. I'll tell you this morning, that's not worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you see this motley crew that God has called out to make a colony of heaven, to unite in the gospel and lock shields for its advance to the glory of our God? And to do this with much difference and warts and sins and weaknesses makes God look all the more glorious when we play in harmony, making beautiful noise by lifting up the cross of Christ. That is to live worthy of the gospel. Do you, do you know anything of this? I pray that you do by the Spirit of God. Have you spent your life going from church to church, criticizing it until you get fed up enough and go to the next church that gets the blessing of having you in its membership? I pray that that would end here this morning. Your trail of bleeding people over your life that you were faithful with by blowing them up with non-essentials instead of the gospel, I pray that would end this morning. It's not worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not too late to repent of this this morning if you spent your whole life being a gnarly dude. It's not too late. I pray that you might look to God and be healed and forgiven and cleansed and unified and used for the kingdom advancement. Maybe one last hard question and we'll move on. Have you let lesser things take up your heart and mind and soul and strength? Are you Martha? Oh, Martha, you're troubled about so many things. Come sit at the feet of Jesus and make him your all in all and your focus and grab hands with this called out bunch and advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you more concerned about our warts or our graces? I pray you see what God's doing in each and every heart. So let's get real. You ready? Paul's going to address this immediate problem and struggle that we will face as we join hands together to advance the gospel. My question is, why is everybody not doing that? Uh, what is it? Well, if you bear a proper witness for Christ, you will be persecuted. You will be persecuted. In John 15, 20, remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, Jesus, they will persecute you. 
2 Timothy 3.12, and indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's promised. It's innate that darkness hates the light. And if we shine rightly, we won't just be nice people and good old boys. Christ said we will be hated on account of him. And the more resemblance to him, the more our message is of him, you will get hated. And if you want the world to love you and admire your ethics and morality, just go join a cult. If you want the world to spit you out and have no use for you, it's right here. And listen to Paul's resume in 1 Corinthians 4. When we're slandered, we try to conciliate. We've become as the scum of the world and the dregs of all things even till now. What a great resume. The scum of the world and the dregs of all things. I thought about getting a shirt. <laughs> Why would anybody sign up for that? What's wrong with you? I just I remember when I was a kid, all the commercials for the army, they, they would massage it a little bit. Come join for adventure, travel, see the world, get a, uh, respect, and you're like, that's not how you go see the world. <laughs> and I don't, I think we're doing the same thing in the church. We, have, we, we join for this reason. We've seen a treasure hidden in a field, and we'll go sell all that we have that we might have that treasure. I count all things lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, whom I've suffered the loss of all things. I will suffer anything for him who suffered all for me on the cross. When I look at Christ, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. There's salvation in no other name. And so I will take up my cross and I will follow after him. And so what's the problem? I mean, isn't that easy? Well, we're, we're wired since the fall to protect ourselves, And we love self-comforts, especially in America. We, we've been trained to move toward ease and comfort. We want to be loved and accepted and respected. And we get saved, and there's a hangover that still likes acceptance. I don't like being the laughing stock of my neighborhood. It just doesn't feel good. I don't, I don't like at the office where everybody snickers when I walk by. Uh, I'm happy in my little rut being quiet. I mean, pastor, I'm bold. I put a verse on my door knocker. What more do you want from me? I don't know. I don't know. We have Philippians 1, because I want you to hear this. The fellowship of the gospel in verses 3 through 8, every one of you said, yes, let's fellowship on the gospel. And then prayer, yeah, Let's pray for excellent lives. Uh, The the spread of the gospel, yes. For me to live as Christ, yeah, I like that. And then Monday comes and the pressure resumes and my mouth stays closed and the pursuit of neighbors gets swallowed up by my busyness. Why? Because it's just hard to get excited about being rejected and hated and maybe losing a job. I, I like my job. I like my neighbor. I I like most of my family. I don't need any more enemies. I don't like being thought foolish. That's real. So Paul's going to say, how do you get past that fear? Because if we're going to be united in the gospel and go stand and move in it, we have to lose our fear of what's coming when we do it, because you know what's coming. So how do I get over that fear? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you four encouragements to joyfully receive persecution. Not just receive it, joyfully receive persecution. So you'll come with me. It's promised. In verse 28, no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. So I want you to hear this. It's promised. The word for alarmed referred to a horse that gets skittish. And I'm not a horse expert, but I... When I was a kid, I, I, the only horse I ever rode, you put a penny in it at King Supers. And I, that's no joke. That's, his, that's my horse experience. But from what I understand in studying, they can get skittish. And, and what this is saying is your demeanor, no matter what happens, I, I don't get spooked at everything. I'm not shaken by my opponents. I know what's coming. I, I won't be shook when this world hates me and comes against me. It's promised. Don't be timid. Be meek and gentle. 
but bold as a lion, with a boldness that is unflinching in the truths of Jesus Christ. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. Our message will never fit with tolerance. The world hates a narrow gospel. And you preach it, and you'll be persecuted. It's promised. So when they say you're a bigot, you're a hater, you're closed-minded, you're foolish, uh, and they make you feel like you're from another planet, don't be skittish. Don't, don't get spooked. There, there's a conspiracy against the gospel. And Paul says just, it's promised. Second, it's a proclamation. In verse 28, there, suffering persecution, he says, is a sign. And, and here's the sign. For those persecuting, it's their sign of their destruction. And for those being persecuted, it's a sign that you're saved. It's a sign of your salvation. So the, the persecuting ones, it's showing that they hate Jesus, they hate the gospel. And when you're willing to be persecuted for the proclamation of the gospel, it shows forth that you're a child of God, that you're willing to suffer for King Jesus. So this idea caused most of the commentators I read to start talking about the Roman gladiatorial contests. And what would happen in these contests is Caesar would sit there on his throne at the Colosseum and the gladiators would go at it and one would prevail and he'd put a foot on the other's chest and he would look up to Caesar for a sign. And we do this in some of our elder meetings and a thumbs up is victory and a thumbs down means, so we're not talking about death. We're just like, do we agree or disagree? So they would look at Caesar and it's like, yep, victory. And then the, down, the, the, the person would be destroyed. And so this persecution is a sign. And this sign is a thumbs up for us. You're a child of God. Thumbs down for the persecutor. It shows that he's an enemy of God and his destruction is coming. So get this, this conflict, this opposition and persecution for the gospel. It's a sign of a great reality. Your blessed destiny and theirs. It shows you that you love Christ more than acceptance, esteem, and honor. It's proving forth your faith. Wear, wear it like a badge. Love persecution. I love when someone says, aren't you overdoing it a little bit? No, he, he deserves more. He deserves more. It shows you that you love Christ more. So persecution cries out, you're salty. Approval, strokes, how nice you are means you lost your saltiness. How can I be made salty again? Do you see suffering as a sign 15 miles to heaven? You're almost home. Yeah. Opposition is not God is against you. Rather, God is going to save you. It's all, it's, it's not, everything's all wrong, but it's everything is right. This is right. This is what God promised. So persecution is promised and it's proclaimed. It's a sign. And the one that has flipped me to help me with, I'm just, I'm the cowardly lion by nature, um, is it's predestined. This next argument is overwhelming. Uh, this has to push you out of your comfort zone and your sealed lips. Come journey with me in verse 29. For to you, it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer <coughs> for his sake. What, what do you see repeated twice in that verse? You can yell it out if you see it. You see anything that <coughs> gets repeated twice? <coughs> Good. This, it's the key of the whole thing, for his sake. So I want you to see that it has been granted to you to suffer and the word granted, I love this, it's, it's from the root charis where we get the word grace. It, it, is, it is a grace gift. It's not the anger of God. It's a gracious gift when you are persecuted for your faith. And it says that you are, you're granted uh, not only to believe in him. This, this is a, a I don't want to get too technical, an aorist inceptive that it's talking about the origin, the beginning, and it's in the passive. So what I want you to see is you didn't do this. You've been acted upon. Grace produces faith. Sometimes I don't know how you can say it any clearer. It's been granted to you not only to believe in him, but also to suffer. And, and it just, he just says it so clear. It can't get any better than that. Can, can you put anything else on the scale? 
I'm going to just lose my notes for a second. So here it is. You, every blessing comes through faith in Philippians. And God has granted you the gift of faith. And you have received every spiritual blessing. I don't, there is not a greater gift than to have the gift of faith. And I just want you to be overwhelmed that God has given you that gift. Treasure it and, and put it on a scale. And he says, not only that, but on the other side of the scale is to suffer for his name's sake. I like the gift of faith. Even. He's also given you the gift to suffer for his name. And I, I'm trying to get my mind around these two being the greatest blessings that I have. But I believe in Christ, and I get to suffer for the name of Jesus. I get to have fellowship in his sufferings. It's a gift. It's going to sanctify you. It's going to do mighty things in your life to have this gift, to suffer for the name of Christ. And I think that is what sanctifies this for Christ's sake, for his sake. Don't miss it. I am suffering for the name of Jesus. I am being persecuted because I'm lifting up the name of Jesus. I'm living for Jesus and this world is spitting me out. Thank you for faith and thank you for the gift to suffer for your name's sake. You get to show Jesus his value and he died in your place and I get to go suffer now by lifting up this name and proclaiming him and sharing and loving. And praise be to God for our group from North Africa. The cost, the cost, yeah. And then in verse 30, Paul's, his, his pastoral encouragement, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here, to be in me. He's just encouraging that Philippi, since the gospel came, you've, you've watched me suffer. I'm writing this from prison. I got people preaching the gospel just to cause me trouble. And he's just sitting here going, you, you, you've watched it in me. Come have fellowship in my sufferings as well for the gospel. And so I wanted to close out. I just want to read you a passage real quick. Paul says this, Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it's good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods through which those who were occupied were not benefited. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought in the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin they're burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus, also that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the camp. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we're seeking the city which is to come. Let us go outside the camp where Jesus went and died in our place and come suffer for his name. We don't have a lasting city here. Quit trying to build your kingdom here. Build the one that is, whose builder and maker is God and it's forever and it's eternal. And then I'm gonna close out with some application that, um, I don't know if you're, it, 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 it's gonna cut, but it's necessary. Because I've been just spending all week looking at the beauty of what happens when we lock shields for the gospel. And, the, and what breaks this is disunity. And, and, it, and it's not living worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what I've been learning over the last couple of years, really since I've come into ministry, is, is usually what breaks unity are non-essentials. The, the things that are not going to cause your salvation, your sanctification, and your getting to glory. And, and, and you'll blow up churches and you'll divide them and you'll split over them and break unity over non-essentials. And so the other thing I watch is conscience issues where they're, they're not commandments, but, f but for you, you've, you've gotten your conviction on them and, and then you spend the rest of your life making sure everybody else lives according to your rules and principles. And I've, I've watched that hurt the unity because it, it gets us off on lesser things and, it, and we lose what binds us together. 
And so what I've seen that I wanted to address this morning for five minutes, and I'll let you go, is in James 1, James says, if any man thinks himself to be religious, and I hope it's everyone sitting in this room, and yet cannot bridle his tongue, his religion is worthless. So no matter what I say about my profession and who I am, if my tongue is just out of control and wounding and hurting, uh, he says your profession means nothing. And so there's something about the Holy Spirit and a believer that begins to bridle the tongue and now use it for good, to, to save, to sanctify, to build people up, to encourage, to pray for them. The gift of a tongue is a, an amazing thing. But I, I grew up with six brothers, and, and we learned how to use it as a weapon. Um, you know, so you, you, you had to use your tongue to stay alive uh, in, a, in a family like that. Uh, right, guys? Uh, my, my boys are saying, I know what you're talking about, pops. Um, so the, the psalmist prays, God, set a guard over my mouth. Put a guard. So before I open my mouth, let me ask, is it true? Is it necessary? Does love demand it? Is it to edify? So that my words just don't come out wagging and cutting and slicing and breaking unity. And that, that saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I've spent a whole lifetime counseling people whose words actually hurt more than people who threw sticks and stones at them. That the tongue can do great harm and great damage. Set a guard, O oh Lord, over my mouth. Jerry Bridges, I was reading this week from a friend of mine. He wrote some comments on it I want to borrow. He said, uh, he wrote the book, Respectable Sins, and they're the sins that you get comfortable with, the sins that, you know, there's so much around you that you don't think about them. These sins are viewed as minor, and they're not addressed in the church. Knowingly or unknowingly, we let them slide, said Bridges. <clears throat> we become desensitized to them, and we justify them. And Jesus says on the last day at judgment, by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned. So this isn't works righteousness. It's saying that when you're saved, your, your tongue is going to go in a new direction. And when you're unsaved, your, your tongue is going to prove what's in your heart. And so the tongue will always be the nice little x-ray of what is in your heart. And slander and gossip, sowing discord, division, and confusion will break the unity of the Spirit in a church. The devil is called the slanderer. So how can we fight this as a family and individually to help with this? And so I just wrote down three things, and I'll let you go, okay? I said five minutes, but I, I didn't say it wouldn't be three things. So first, I just want you to ask yourself this. Does this information involve me? or affect me directly. Matthew 18 says we go to them individually. Uh, we don't dress it up as a prayer request. Will you pray for me? Because Jim did this to me, and he said this, and he said that. Uh, I just have a concern. You can dress gossip up in so many cute little dresses and fancy little stuff, ribbons and bows. and um, just It's gossip. Does this information involve me or affect me directly? Secondly, what is the reason that the person is passing this information on to me. If it's not genuine Christ-like care and concern to lovingly bring correction to a person, then remove yourself from the conversation. I love what my brother said. Have you, have you gone to that person? Remove yourself. Have you gone to that person? If the motive is love, uh, but not the best way to deal with it, Offer to mediate. Let, let's go to that person and talk this over. It takes courage to keep the unity in this way because when you do that, you know what people call you? Oh, you're holier than thou. You just think you're so good. And it's going to take a whole body that says, no, have you gone to that person? Uh, I'm not going to receive that. Well, one Puritan said, it's taken the devil in your ear to hear those things. It has nothing to do with me have you gone to that person in love to go and correct and, and help each other? And then what's going on in my heart thirdly? If we're tempted to pass on slander and gossip, it's a heart issue. What is at the root issue in my heart? Is it pride, revenge, others' approval, suspicion, 
Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart and see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And so just some practical application is we keep the unity of the Spirit because it's, it's so we can put forth the gospel and show the world the beauty of what it is. And one thing that can quickly break that unity is, is the tongue that's not bridled and a tongue that isn't faithful, that doesn't go to brothers and sisters and correct. And, and if someone shares it with you, what does that usually tell you? They love you most often. If they tell everyone else, what does that tell you? They want to hurt you. And so I just want you to grow in agape as we're praying, let my love grow more and more in real discernment. How do I go to brothers and sisters and, and help them and care and share? How do I not hurt them by going to others and sharing and tearing down with, with second and third hand information? And so as a body, you unify and you say, I'm not going to listen to that. Have you gone to that person? Go talk to them in private. Because James says these little matches can start a forest fire. And you start gossiping and receiving other people's gossip and slander, and you'll start a forest fire. And my point for bringing this up, that's not worthy of the gospel. That is not worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, and let me speak truth and love and edification and build up. I pray that we would um, unify for the gospel of Jesus Christ and fight. Next week, we're going to look at humility. And what breaks unity is this pride. And it's humility that God will use to put the gospel of Jesus Christ on display because Christ is the picture of humility. So I pray, let's, let's put an end. Let's not let it be a respectable sin at all in this church with our tongues to hold each other tight for the glory of Christ and the good of others. Let's pray. Father, I pray that um, you would teach us by your spirit to bridle our tongues. A 1,500-pound wild animal can't be controlled. Put a little bridle in it, and it'll go wherever you want. God, bridle our tongues. Use them for the gospel. Use them to, to build up, to share the gospel. To, to, to pray over hurting souls, to encourage. Lord, put an end. Put an end to that garbage. Let it not reside starting in my own heart and every heart in this room. Oh God, the gospel is worthy of unified brothers and sisters hoping and believing in each other, helping each other grow so that we can lift up the name of Jesus Christ and we will, will be a sign that says 15 miles to heaven. God, let us shine. Let us show forth the glories of this gospel. Let us live worthy of the gospel that we have received in Christ Jesus. And it's in his name that we do pray. Amen.